Namibia Votes 2024. Follow along as Cosmos 94.1 speak to various political parties and presidential candidates to find out what their position is on various political issues and social issues in the country as well as environmental issues. My name is Jeanette Bierkes and I will be taking you through this interesting series as we will be uncovering what our parties stand for and the presidential candidates stand for and who you should vote for 27 November. Good day viewers and welcome to Namibia Votes 2024. Today I will be speaking to Honorable Bernard Swatboy from the Landless People's Movement. From the Landless Party, yes, People's Movement. Correct, correct, <laughs> yes. Honorable, how are you doing today? Well, well, Sylvie, thank you. Yes, it is so lovely to have you here. Sure, sure. We're excited to hear what you have to tell us. Your blue here represents another political party. No, uh, but you, you shouldn't we are look at colors. We, we're color blind today. Ah. <laughs> Good. Okay, so I'm going to jump right into it, sure. seeing that it's political season and everybody is, everybody wants to know what your views and stance is on various issues. So our first question is, with the increasing poverty in the country, um, what are the approaches that the LPM will take to address these issues and what are the root causes of the poverty? Well, that's a very broad question. I don't know whether the 20-minute brackets is going to help. But that's a whole thesis on its own. But indeed, <laughs> poverty has increased, and you can just see the consequence of that poverty is extreme hunger. So we are sort of of the view that we'll deal with the matter from the consequence uh, to minimize the consequences of hunger. And uh, although our manifesto is not yet completed, we are looking at, for instance, a, a grant that we want to give people for at least about five years a meaningful grant and we'll have to see what the economy can afford uh, and that is meant as a temporary intervention while we're dealing with the medium to long term issue and that issue really has to do with fixing our agriculture mm -hmm. not just livestock stock agriculture but agriculture that produces uh, the entire value chain uh, that we have uh, lacked for for so long in Namibia. Remember we are planting things like dates and grapes but these are export uh, goods it does not help the nutritional situation in the country and we are saying we'll have to engage in agriculture that allows both for the country to export and gain um, foreign currency but also uh, agriculture that is able to be consumed locally your fruits your vegetables and so on and thereby reduce the dependency on other countries the challenge is therefore uh, how to make land productive how to enhance the a cooperation between commercial farmers, the government, uh, resettled farmers, and the entire broader communal farming sector, and how to entice uh, these sectors within the farming community to not just be in livestock farming, but also to be in, in irrigated agriculture. That has to do also with how you provide water at an affordable rate to farmers that want to produce, how you provide the necessary uh, necessary capitalization from the agribank and so ours is a multifaceted approach of dealing with the consequence dealing with the question of hunger and malnutrition reducing severe stunting of uh, children under the age of five uh, because how do you want people to dream about tomorrow if they have not eaten for two or three weeks and yeah. this is really the crux of the matter we want to deal with first feeding people and therefore ensuring that we have an agriculture that is vibrant that is sustainable that is export oriented but also allows uh, the country to benefit from from the work that is done there. yeah you briefly mentioned so i assume that this is in your manifesto as well well we are drafting the manifesto but that is how okay. it is beginning to be formulated and the causes of poverty are manifold i mean yeah. it's it's a structural question that the economy works for the few that uh, uh, the economy grows in the financial services sector, for instance, without creating single jobs, that the over-reliance uh, on the extractive sector, which merely just creates so many jobs, but if you had gone into value addition, you were going to also add the number of jobs that you would have created. And so it's a multiple number of things, but bottom line is also that the trickle-down economic theories that the West has imposed on us for many years simply does not work. And so we are, with this grant, trying to look at direct transfers mm -hmm to alleviate poverty directly and to put money in the hands of the citizen yes. that would be able to, uh, to use the money. What we're also saying, which is quite revolutionary, uh, Sylvie, is that 
from 2027, we would have the first oil drops coming out of the Atlantic. And our view is to follow some of the models that Norway uses to, to say money from the oil revenues must actually land in the hands of people again, another direct transfer. So uh, we recognize the limitation of the trickle-down economic theories and the practical application of that trickle-down has meant that it trickles to only so many people and the rest of society gets left behind, young people are unemployed, young women become much more vulnerable to transactional sexual relations and emotional relations that in itself enhances gender-based violence and, and creates again a great criminalization of young men. And so you have a chain reaction around this question mm -hmm. of the structural questions around the economy that leaves so many outside the, the benefits of a function economy. And the idea is to look at direct transfers that are sustainable, that are affordable, that are durable, but not to an entire society to stop looking for jobs and to keep on, on building themselves. People must still do the schoolwork, the hard and the tough work so that they can move from one station to the next. Uh, but the direct transfers are definitely one of the ways that we want to tackle the question of poverty immediately. Yeah. Yes. So uh, without giving too much away in terms of your manifesto, what other key areas will the manifesto be looking at? Oh, manifestos are generally uh, templates of one versus the other. So mm -hmm. uh, they often do not have a lot of uh, differences. But what we have been careful to do is to uh, not to load people with too many words, too many vocabulary. What we are saying is as a landless people's movement that the question of land is important, not the reckless way in which people have dealt with it in other parts of the country, but to uh, look at the question of land, therefore agriculture, to look at the question of land, therefore housing, to look at the question of land, therefore the question of mining. How do societies vulnerable access and gain ownership into the property market, into the mining sector, not just as employers, um, but also as small miners? Uh, there are so many people right now in the on the fringes of the Orange River that have been arrested because they are into small mining and so on. They want to liberalize some of those things so that yeah. people can easily go into mining, small scale mining, without the harassment from the Ministry of Mines and Energy, without the harassment from uh, environmental uh, uh, consultants and, and others that claim that they know everything, or without the harassment of people from uh, the, the Ministry of Labor that would uh, keep on uh, wanting to impose this, that, on the, or the other. Uh, requirements on people. And then, of course, the question of education. I mean, it's dreadful what we have. That today, if you are an average Namibian uh, earning less than two, three hundred thousand per year, the chances of your child sitting on a grade 12 bench are zero. Mm -hmm. School has now become officially uh, completed to the moment your child reaches grade 11. We've got to fix that because the difficulty is that dysfunction where you now have a grade 11 uh, as the final grade in your school, unless you pass mathematics or English at a certain grade, which is not our mother tongue, and now you suddenly impose a particular level beyond which a child necessarily does not need to be judged as a basis for them to pro progress to grade 12. And now, therefore, you have this uh, gap within what the high school final grade is versus what the entry requirements are for, for the university. And now the universities are saying we are not going to reduce our entry into into yeah, entry requirements into 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 our our curriculum. You've got to have grade twelve, mm -hmm. but only those that have money that can take their kids to private school, or that can allow them to uh, increase uh, uh, the opportunity to enhance their grades. Only these children will probably ever be on the grade twelve seat. This is a horrible, horrible uh, destruction that is already happening today, in which the adults of tomorrow are being ostracized, are being completely removed from the possibility of a decent further education. Then, of course, we will be looking uh, at, at the question of, of, of housing as a matter of urgency. Mm -hmm. There's a huge backlog of more than half a million houses. Uh, young professionals that are starting up are unable to access decent housing. They have now passed in parliament as a result of a lot of pressure, but uh, something which they should have done. The, the transfer bill, transfer duty bill, that will now allow, it has now become, and I think the president will sign it soon, will allow people to buy houses uh, up to, I think, 1.1 million without paying transfer duties. That helps the pockets of, of first-time homeowners. Uh, uh, but 
the point is to provide houses on a massive scale. And clearly the National Housing Enterprise cannot do it. And our approach is uh, not only all of the above type where National Housing Enterprise is an option, where Build Together is, is an option, where Shack Dwellers is an option, where developers are an option, but also to say that local authorities must come into the fray. Local authority knows how many people in their terrain, in their space, do not have houses. Once you give them the budget, they can build every year either in Riyabot or Shakati or Swakop or Hobabas, uh, two, three hundred houses. They know it. They know the individuals. They know the affordability ratios within their communities. They know the land space that is available. And because the locality led by the local authority will be involved in building those houses themselves, will be creating local jobs. Not to put those on tender and public procurement, but put it as a means of job creation driven by local authorities themselves. So that's an important one really, where housing together with land is a central focus on what we want to do as LPM so that people can actually access real property, mm -hmm. meaningful, costed property that can help that person even to access a further bank loan and to do many other things on the basis of this collateral that they now have, which they wouldn't have had if they continue to vote for the same political party that they have voted for the past 34 years. So we have about five pillars, really. I want to go through all of them that uh, as a party we're focusing on. But the idea is not to load the listeners with many of the pillars that we have, but to basically give them the gist of what it is that we want to address immediately. And one of those things from day one would address is to open up grade 12 to all learners. One of those things that we'll do on day one is to allow local authorities to give land free of charge to those Namibians that cannot afford this land and to ensure that we have money in the immediate budget allocation given to local authorities to start developing housing units on their own land and create jobs in the localities. Yeah. Too many young people are idle. Too many young people do not even have the chance ever to get a job. Uh, and least of all, if you cannot even get a job that pays you two, three thousand, whenever is it that you are going to ever uh, afford a house that you can live in. So the structure of the economy is not working. The approach of the state institutions is also on the basis of trickle down where there's a strong center and the regional governments and the local authorities are left at the fringes. But therein lies the answer. The full utilization of the capacity of the local authorities is where the answer lies. To enhance service delivery, to fight poverty, to fight youth unemployment, to fight gender-based violence and all other ills that affect society. Yes. You also mentioned uh, the next point that we're going to the structure of the economy. Yeah. What are the main structural problems that you are noticing in Namibia currently? Well, first, one of the structural issues is, is, is really the ownership question about the opportunity that you will never have in this country to own a mine, to own a decent piece of land, uh, to build a house. The other is one in which the the private sector itself is is, is being squeezed out by an overbearing state that is coming into all sectors of society. If you now look at the retail fuel sector, uh, Namco is both a bulk supplier of fuel to all other private uh, companies, but it is also now into the retail sector of fuel supplies. You see these Namco service stations that are put up. I would have understood if the idea of the retail uh, Namco uh, entry into the market was on the basis of areas where the private sector is unable to go. So smaller places, villages, settlements where the private sector is not able to go in, that they would then fill those gaps within the, the, the economy to provide services to the community. But now they are competing and in some instances out competing the private sector. So you have a circumstance in which the private sector is squeezed more and more and that the public sector is taking over more and more of the private sector space. Even in the meat industry, Midco used to be owned by the farmers. Now, government took over. Boom, it's bankrupt. What is the private sector now doing? It's trying to pick up the, the, the sector from state destruction. And now they are trying to do Savannah beef. There's another beef core company in Okahanja. 
And so the structure of the economy doesn't open up opportunities for people to move from uh, 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 basically job seekers to owners within, within the system. The mines continue to be owned by those from the foreign governments, uh, the Chinese and others. Uh, the structure of the economy is such that the educational qualifications that you have does not align with what the market has available. The structure of the economy is such that we are not able to, uh, for one or the other reasons, grow our manufacturing sector. Our manufacturing, manufacturing sector as a share of the GDP is about 10 to 12 percent where it was in 1981-1982 period, so you see a complete stagnation of the manufacturing sector. The structure of the economy is based on imports uh, and far less exports, and therefore we export money and resources to other countries, then we create opportunities and jobs here. The structure of the economy is on a few of the farmers that have access to land, that have access to good water, that have access to good banking uh, uh, loan schemes, uh, that only those ones can actually farm productively and earn a decent life and uh, um, make a good contribution to the total agricultural economy. And the structure of the economy is such, therefore, that even in the resettlement scheme, they have now upgraded the, the, uh, uh, the requirements that if you want to qualify for a resettlement farm, you must be able to show assets worth of two million and maybe dollars before your application gets processed. These are structural bottlenecks that does not allow your grade 12 graduate or your university graduate to participate meaningfully in the economy. And at the same time, the structure of the economy is such that the manufacturing sector is not growing, uh, but the tertiary sector is growing. Uh, that tertiary sector is, on, is owned by a few South African banks who are incorporated in Namibia, and then by a, a retail sector that is primarily dominated by South African uh, uh, brands without uh, uh, those brands to a large extent, with exception here and there of ShopRite, but generally not participating in the agricultural economy and the activities as part of a value chain with farmers in this country. Mm -hmm. They still import from South Africa, your apples, your bananas, everything. Of course, you cannot plant everything in this country, but those things that could be sourced from here are often not sourced from, from, from the local um, uh, farmers uh, as they should so that these retail shops can also help to create downstream uh, agricultural enhancement and modernization but they just keep on relying on, on South Africa and so on. So these structural difficulties also include the state's participation in, in the negative. Uh, there are uh, for instance in, in the mining sector only certain number of uh, uh, people that are able to afford, for instance, your EPR licenses, uh, the exploration licenses, yeah. uh, and that, that that is really a closed system uh, where even the communities cannot participate as a group in owning mines and mining rights in this country. Mm. So uh, you, you really do not have a developmental state, and that in itself is a, a critical question uh, that defines the character and the content of the economy, where the economy is structurally part of established private sector uh, companies and parastatals and state ministries that determine the, the, the inputs and the outputs within the economy. You have now seen the charcoal industry as a result of the work by farmers that has taken a great uh, uh, leaps and bounds forward and uh, it's in excess of 1.3 billion that farmers are now exporting worth of charcoal where they have taken a dead resource turned the tree into charcoal and mm -hmm. took the charcoal to countries like Greece, Turkey, uh, countries like uh, uh, the United Kingdom as well as countries like South Africa. Now there's over -regularization. now there is the European Union that imposes uh, uh, restrictive practices and, and regulations, which this government, without consulting farmers, just keeps on blocking them from one day to the other. If you today are a charcoal producer in this country, whether it's through earth, earth method or through uh, any other method, you just simply don't know whether your business will exist tomorrow, yeah. whether you will get a production or harvesting permit of charcoal tomorrow. 
because the regulations keep on being changed. Species that were not endangered suddenly become declared endangered species. And, and this is the excess of power of the state in the economy that, dis that disturbs the, f the flow of doing business in this country. Then again, the challenges of the nature of registration of PDY limited, of close corporation, still takes too long. Still too many documents that you must complete. Still too many restrictive practices within the banking sector. And now the structure of the economy is now even further being uh, uh, limited by the laws that were passed last year that the Americans and the Western world is putting uh, up uh, allegedly to uh, stop uh, money laundering and all these types of things. But uh, the consequence that those restrictive regulations has on businesses and on the administration of a business, on the, on the tax regime that businesses must, 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 must deal with, it's just exorbitantly super, super uh, uh, red taped to the point that the administration of your business becomes uh, the bigger part of your business yeah. instead of doing the business itself. The tax regime is not favorable. That's part of the structure of the business. Those of, 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 of the economy, those that uh, uh, are now becoming new entrants into the, the, the businesses, for instance, in the tourism sector, are treated as though they were also long established uh, businesses. And so even during COVID, so many of the new black uh, tourism companies closed down because they had excess of loan regimes that charge them as though they, are, they have taken loans at a commercial bank, but they were sitting with development bank loans. Mm -hmm. But there was no difference literally between the development bank loan and your first national bank loan. The interest rates were the same. And we're saying, what type of a structure of the economy is this where this is a development bank, its mandate is developmental, but it does, does its business on strictly commercial basis. And so it restricts the person's capacity to hire more people, to pay them more salaries, to advertise and market their business, to expand their business portfolio, to enhance the opportunity for diversification of their business. It restricts and limits, if not decapitates, the ability of the person even to want to enter into another sector of the economy because all the sectors of the economies, economy are so restricted. Okay. And part of that really has to do with protection of few business interests that the elite and their friends have entered into. Yeah. Hmm. And looking at the economy, we are fast progressing into the fourth industrial revolution. So I wanted to find out from you, what would be the best way to empower rural communities when it comes to implementing and rolling out for IR? Well, you, you, are, you are completely far ahead, Sylvie. I mean, we are still solving problems of the 19th century, 20th yeah. century. We're still building pit latrines. Pit latrines, correct, correct. We, we, we still have um, a, a lot of corrugated iron sheet houses. And by the way, the rural area has gotten into the urban centers. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a very interesting mix in which corrugated iron sheet houses we used to know in rural areas when we were children. And we knew that if you go into a town, these are brick houses with electricity, with uh, uh, sanitation and so on during apartheid and so yeah. on. Today, your corrugated iron sheet house on the farm is probably far better than the corrugated iron sheet house that you live uh, in Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. So what has happened is that the 18th and the 19th century has caught up with cities in Africa and in the third world that think, hope and pray that they are in the 21st century. So here in this area, you can say you are in the 21st century. Yeah. Go to Katitura where we are campaigning and you say, this is a rural area. But someone will say, hey, 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 this is the city of Vindic Boundary. And so I'm not even going to answer you on fourth industrial revolu uh, 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 revolution. Uh, uh, revolution in relation to the lack of that revolution uh, uh, in the rural areas uh, because there are other revolutions in the rural areas that have not even taken place. The enhancement of rural areas in terms of sanitation and water supply, the enhancement of the rural economy as a global um, empowerment scheme that has enabled many societies to rely on rural areas to build uh, the urban economy. You go to Zimbabwe, when things went bad, 
I'm just mentioning, trying to do, draw a comparative as to no what Zimbabwe did with its agriculture and how we can actually copy from somebody. The rural areas were maintaining the urban areas because the rural agricultural economy was well developed, both in terms of the number of uh, irrigation schemes that were set up, the, the number of small and medium-sized enterprises that were developed, the value chains that were developed, the, the taxing regime that allowed farmers to transport their goods freely and to trade the, the, those goods freely. And that when the sanctions hit Zimbabwe so hard, Zimbabwe as a state and society did not collapse mm -hmm. because they had a basis first to feed themselves and to feed the entire Zimbabwe from one end to the other, from rural to urban. And so here in this country, I, 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 I find it absolutely difficult to comprehend why we have not resolved the question of water. You go to so many areas in this country, it's just a problem of water. But the land is fertile. The people are willing to work, young blood, people of experience, livestock that could have had a lot of feedlots in this country. The right now we are losing so many of our livestock because we have to sell them at a young age so that they go to South African feedlots and they get the better share of the market. But you even have a political decision that was taken to build the largest dam in this country. Mm -hmm. But that largest dam has not become the largest irrigation project because another political decision was taken to never open the irrigation scheme of that dam for as long as the Landless People's Movement governs Clara's region. So these are the political decisions that hamper first the resolution of old challenges of hunger, of poverty in respect of food poverty and nutrition poverty, the old challenges of decision making regardless of political party colors and that you actually serve society for its own interests to the best of your abilities regardless of political party colors and so on. So in terms of fourth industrial revolution, we will fall behind. Yeah. Because right now Starlink has also applied. If I speak to the farmers, they would say, allow Elon Musk and Starlink to operate here because MTC and Telecom and Powercom are not able to service us in the Namib Desert, in pockets of Zambezi, in areas of the Kunene, deep fringe areas that meet the Atlantic Ocean, where there is a lot of tourism happening, where there's a lot of agriculture happening. Some of these telecoms providers cannot do that. But Starlink, you just buy a box, boom, it's fast, fourth industrial revolution, you are connected by, via satellite link, it's mm -hmm. affordable, it's super faster than the local systems. What are we saying? We can't do it because Starlink will take our resources. South Africa has refused it. And what is it? It's because once we allow Starlink in, the argument is the revenue system and the streams that the telecoms and the MTCs have will completely collapse because technologically they are far behind and Starlink is techno technologically ahead. So what are we there for? at the end of the day, protecting. Are we protecting jobs? Well, if we are protecting jobs, let's speak to Elon Musk and say, Elon, look, listen, if we allow Starlink here, we want to be there, Papa. We want to, we want to be at the apex of whatever you can give us. We are a small country, small population, big country, many resources. What are the investments that you can come and bring? And what are the partnerships mm -hmm. that you can come and bring to uh, veer off this potential loss? And what are the shareholderships that you can in uh, subsidiary companies create for us so that we ultimately do not lose all our ability to have national companies like MTC and Telecom, but that we also do not lose, lose our ability to enter into a, a, a global company with best cutting edge technologies and that we are some way ahead with the rest of the world in terms of technologies. If we allow Starlink, what are, what are we saying in terms of education? Can you allow us to, to beam that through to the most rural schools so that we train our teachers and Starlink can help us to bridge the digital divide. Can we do it? I'm sure we can. Will we do it? I doubt we will. Why? Because we have the wrong people at the right place at the right time and they have been there for 34 years. So we have a lot of exciting answers to issues. Why? Because we believe that a government must be flexible, a political party leader and, and political leaders in any political party must be flexible, must be attuned to the realities of the time, must be globally oriented, but not forgetting the national character and dimension of their society, and must do everything possible to outcompete other parts of the world in whatever leverage we can get. And Elon Musk is a South African-born person. 
Would he not be sympathetic to Africa? Probably. But do we know? We don't. Will we speak to him? I'm sure we will not speak to him. But we'll keep on complaining about the problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. We need young leadership that can resolve practical issues applicable to today. That's a problem. There are old candidates that are being paraded as the, as the present of the old generation to the future. They are seen as the ones that will bring stability to society. Our society is so unstable. So many people are dying. So many of these people are dying at the hands of doctors because the doctors don't have the medication, the necessary equipment, the necessary tools to help people that come to the hospitals. Machines are not operational. But this government will go and buy brand new vehicles while cancer machines are not operational. While you have just one machine in, in, in this whole country dealing with the question of cancer and so on. So when you get diagnosed with certain types of cancer, you know that death has already visited you. You are a dead man or a dead woman walking. Why should that be normal? Why should corrugated iron sheet houses of Kilimanjaro, of Sivandalan, of Axtalan, why should it be normal? And the decision is up to Namibians. If that is normal, they will go vote the same way they have voted. If they find something wrong with that system, they will join us, vote for us, and move forward so that we build better houses. We redirect the focus from creating many ministries and employing many people that don't serve any interest to a directing resources of the public, combine it with private sector and global resources to build houses for people. And besides, that will create a massive number of jobs and we can keep on doing it for 10, 15 years. I'm sure we'll be able to have an oversupply of houses in a measure that the economy can afford and that the housing market will not collapse, but that we'll have the ability to house each and every young person in a house of their choice. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned young leadership in the country. Youth unemployment has become a big topical issue. Of course, we all know that. But then I wanted to find out from you, what is the LPM doing to mitigate the issue of youth unemployment? Well, in the areas where we are governing, we have done exactly the things that we are saying already at a malicious scale, but nonetheless impactful. We have created a number of jobs, sometimes 100, sometimes 80, sometimes 70, by allowing the local authority actually to engage into paving of roads, putting up uh, uh, a lot of uh, interlocking roads, and we take directly from the streets those young people that would otherwise be idling, and they do the pavings, they do the interlocking roads, they get to be schooled, and so on and so forth. Um, we have also, of course, uh, tried our best to put young people at a better place by adding also from local authority and regional council resources some of the young people that uh, we could afford to send them to school to better their, their, their qualifications and to enhance their place in the market and so on. But you must remember, in local authorities where we are, you have a problem of a dilapidated uh, system of, of, of governance where water and electricity are the only, only two things that local authorities also can afford and society is forced to just to pay water and electricity. And so what we have said is that local authorities require to be much more better resourced as was done during apartheid. Mm -hmm. A small place like Kamanya, a small place like Petani, a small place like um, Onipa, a small place like uh, uh, Kongola or Divundu, a um, small place like Petani could function because the central government would give more and more money to those smaller places where people are so that livelihoods of people can be sustained right there in those spots. So we have created those little, a few jobs in terms of uh, infrastructure development in those localities. We have given some opportunities for education. Then we have also said more and more young people must engage into uh, ownership of, of public corporations. Uh, but we're also finding that the focus of young people is actually to get a job sometimes or most of the times young people themselves do not want to do business uh, that would take a longer period of time, would require a lot of discipline to get them from point A to point B and to point C. Sometimes so many young people want to move from point A to the point where they can drive a Range Rover. Sometimes, not always. There are others that we have supported with SMEs, with equipment, with all sorts of training. Uh, in the regional councillors, in uh, areas, in the constituencies. Some of them are now into smaller retail shops uh, that they have set up uh, in smaller areas. I even visited last week a, 
a business in Tess run by a young lady uh, selling some goods and now she wants to venture into selling some chicken and so on. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the small activities that we have assisted young people to do. But they are not enough simply because we, we merely govern regions and localities uh, uh, that, that are highly indebted and that the real collection of state resources, the taxes, lies with the central government. And you've got to, if you want to make b big and significant changes in this country, actually own a seat at the table of the central government so that resources can be unleashed from the center to the regions and to the localities. That's where the changes will come. Yeah. So if the central government that has all the power and all the resources to affect change could not do anything significant, what we are doing is significant but small, but there's so much room for improvement, but you can only expect so much from a local authority. The answer lies in the central government and who is running the central government. The wrong person is at the central government. Resources cannot go down to where the people are. And that's why you have so much rural urban migration because money is not spent in the local authority areas throughout the country, in the regional areas across the country, and the center keeps the money to look at who to punish and who to award, who is which part political party, which is which political party governing where, will they work with us, will they submit to us. This is the problem. Yeah. 34 years, if you look at Botswana, if you look at China, if you look at Cambodia, if you look at Vietnam, if you look at many of the Asian tigers, including uh, India, the youth unemployment problem should not have been what it is. The industrialization problem should not have been what it is. And we should have been a very, very rich country, a rich society. 30 years is enough to fundamentally transform, transform the structure of the economy, mm -hmm. reshape the uh, uh, sectors of the economy to a higher competitive and further mechanized basis and to diversify the economy in a way that many jobs are, are supported. But as a country, we are stuck. You have said it yourself. Poverty has increased. Here are the statistics. Our shop, I want to read some of them for you. Multidimensional poverty, Kavango West, 79.6%. Here, it's their own studies. It's not our studies. It's National Statistics Agency studies. 79% of people in Kavango West. Kavango East, 70%. 64.1% in Kunene. Out of every 10 persons in Kavango West, 8 are multidimensionally poor. Only two can say to, to have something. Is that not scary? Think about it. Just think about it. In Kunene, out of every 10 people, six are multidimensionally poor. You are poor in terms of education, in terms of malnutrition, in terms of housing, in terms of sanitation, in terms of uh, your health. You are entirely poor multidimensionally. It's not just poverty of food. It's not just poverty of education. It's the entirety of your life that is declared a poverty of sorts that they use the term multidimensionally poor. That's a big word for a small country mm. with a small population with so many resources. We should be multidimensionally rich, but we are multidimensionally poor. And the choice is with people that vote. Will they vote for multidimensional poverty? Or will they vote for multidimensional advancement in education, in healthcare, in nutrition, in food security, in land reform, in housing? What will they vote for? The choice is theirs. You can look uh, at uh, education. My goodness, Sylvie, these things give us headaches. In just 2017, uh, 125,394 children repeated a great. This is more than the population of Valvos by Okainja and Ochivarango together. So 125,000 kids every year repeat a great. Why is that? There's a question of multidimensional poverty that comes into being. You can have as much school feeding programs as you can, but that's just one meal. This child comes from a house without electricity, without water. This child comes from a bro broken home. This child doesn't have sufficient nutrition. The, the food that you will give them at the public uh, feeding program mm -hmm. is probably at 11 o'clock. From 7 o'clock to 11 o'clock, teachers cannot get attention of this child 
only after 12 o'clock can this child really start to focus on their school because they come from multidimensional poverty and you can't teach a child that has multidimensional poverty issues and try to say education is the answer. Education is part of the multidimensional development of the human being. But these are the problems. Just one more statistic I want to read to you. Since 2020, from that year actually to 23, between 81.5% and at the lower end, 79% of Namibian uh, children um, uh, are not able to go to the AS level. Sylvie, my goodness, 81.5% of kids that have enrolled 11 years ago, 81.5% mm -hmm. of the children that enrolled 11 years ago suddenly have their school career come to an abrupt halt. So the whole 11 years comes to nothing because they can't proceed to grade one. Is this normal? If it's normal, vote for what you've been voting for. If it's abnormal, stand and join the wagon that talks about change. On day one, this is what we are going to change. We say, remove this nonsense. Where the child is D in English, that child is proceeding. We were told when I was many centuries ago, I want to say, when I was in grade 12, grade 11, if you don't take mathematics, you are a failure. If you don't take science, you are a dumb child. I had to take science. I got an ungraded in math mathematics. Here I am. Am I a failure? Sure. Damn, I don't think I'm a failure. So this stereotypes about which subjects you must take, that you must have a D or a C in English, therefore you deserve to get a chance at a life that will reward you with blessings. That's wrong. This language, English, and this mathematics, and so on and so forth, does not determine the station where this child will end up. Mm. You can succeed regardless of a D or an E in English. You can. I'm not saying people should not work harder. Of course you must work harder. But it should not be that you are punished because you got a C instead of a B, you got a D instead of a C. That type of education take someone away. These people have not even developed the education system in a way that the sports people can go already and start to be sports people. We push them into the same system of category of academic excellence and academic orientation, but you are killing a sports person, a sports woman. You are even killing a successful businessman that would have been uh, employing even the most educated people. So we have a crisis in terms of the contact concept of what leadership is, what government is, what we do in terms of the policies and ultimately how those policies reverberate around society in the most negative ways. Just drive to Ludwigsdorf and these areas and you will see so many black elite staying there. Go check what they own, mining and fishing quotas. Their kids ain't necessarily smart, mm -hmm but they know that they'll eat something, they'll drive a nice car, they will get into business, they will be given something nice, and they will project themselves as so brilliant and successful, but they have not earned anything. Then you go to Kilimanjaro, some of the kids there, how brilliant they are, and yet you know they will never get a fair shot because somewhere along the, the road, their brothers who finished grade 12 have not gotten any job opportunity or could not study further. When that person sees his entire surrounding, the environment that they grow up, they don't see anyone going further. They ask, but why should I study? Why should I be bothered to finish school if my sister, my brother, my elder, aunt's child never got anywhere? You lose brilliant people because the environment, the physical environment has been destroyed and the internal environment of a child is being destroyed. What would then we be fighting for? What future are we fighting for if the present that must determine the future is like this? 81.5% gone from ever proceeding to grade one. So the issues are painful. The emotional, the psychological trauma of society is so deep, deep, deep. 
that we will require younger leaders with sufficient brain capacity, physical health, and the ability to think outside the box, getting rid of stereotypes and of tribalizing politics. We will need these young leaders to push society forward urgently, not with this old school, not with this old school, not with this old school. Yeah. But the answer lies with the people of Namibia. If things are okay, so be it. Maybe we are seeing ghosts. If things are not okay, well, join us. But these statistics don't lie. We got it from the Namibia Statistics Agency, not LPM office. Mm -hmm. It's the government department that deals with statistics of poverty, of educational standards, of healthcare standards, and so on. They speak here. It's an indictment on the current government. And they had the resources so much that they started to steal because the resources were actually abundant. But these are the choices that people must make. Sylvie. We have a vision to build a society on the basis of equal opportunity and where we've got to discriminate, we'll discriminate in the advantage of those that require that discrimination to get ahead. Women must be pushed forward, the girl child must be pushed forward, boys must be pushed forward, and the men must be pushed forward, not just criminalized as we are doing right now. The safety and security of women must be guaranteed. We'll have to have better trained police officials. We'll have to mean business when we say education is the way to go. We'll have to focus, as you are saying, on bringing the best and cutting edge technologies to enhance the ability of society to close the digital divide right now. We don't have time for old and archaic solutions. If Elon Musk can come and help, we'll say Elon Musk come and help with new revolutionary technologies. We want to have four, five, six satellites in the atmosphere that Namibia will be able to give services to other countries and pay for those services. 400 million. We can put up satellites, 4 billion worth of satellites, and we can give services to meteorological service stations around the world and get paid for that. That's what other countries are doing. They are making a huge killing by putting up satellites in the atmosphere, and we can do it. And weather and other events, they can help other countries uh, with, with, with those satellites and so on. These are the types of things that we should be talking about, to, to look at ways in which we can even have golden visa programs so that those billionaires and millionaires around the world can come, come and settle in Namibia, not giving them farms, no. Give them, give them opportunity to settle and invest at least uh, three, four million in Namibia on a minimum in a small settlement in education, healthcare, in new technologies, in SME development. And then they get a piece of land here. We draw in those resources, a dam like Nekartal Dam. Our thinking is the area where the dam has supposed to, apparently is supposed to have these agricultural plantations is not always the best type of land. Why don't you target British and, and European billionaires and millionaires, enhance water sports there, build hotels there, build a different setup, and then you have a whole new area, golf courses and so on, on the fringes of that dam, where you have developed already water sports and other sorts of sports there. Already, that's a tourism attraction. You bring in millionaires and billionaires, they, they go and, and, and buy properties there, you develop properties there. And on the other side of Notre Dame, you can do your irrigation still. Open-mindedness, open-mindedness open dimensional thinking, not closed monodimensional thinking. This is what we need. Can you imagine how exciting it would be with this person as president of the Republic of Namibia? <laughs> ideas upon ideas, new thinking. You know, every week we will have new ideas coming, propping up, decisions taken, things implemented, life transformed, young people taken abroad. We put up sports centers, excellent centers, high performance centers, tennis, Look, go to Riapo, there by Dr. Lemmer in these areas. Tennis courts, how dilapidated they became. Why? Because we destroyed school sports. School sports is where you begin to groom young people to become excellent athletes, excellent uh, soccer players, rugby players. But school sports is dead now. You have to hire a stadium in South Africa for 1.5 million just to kick the ball around called uh, African Cup of Nations. Here we are. The minister is unveiling, a, a, what is it, a T-shirt apparently Namibian color, resolve problems with us. Five, six, seven, state-of-the-art 
new sporting facilities, high performance centers. There are young people, one of them that I, uh, that I know, a child that grew up in front of me, he was in Russia at the high performance center for swimming for a year. Very top of, 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 of the range uh, sporting person, uh, young boy, Vandanar. Very, very, very good. To go to Russia. So, fine. What are these friends doing? Oh, come, we cannot send 100 children to Russia for two years. High performance center to America, to Jamaica, wherever. And develop those infrastructure also here at the same time. Yeah. What about art? What about music? Where are these things that we can create these opportunities uh, and, and make it uh, a, a matter of livelihoods and income? This is what LPM is saying. Sports and arts will convert it into a business. We are saying Namibia Premier League, Rugby League, Tennis Leagues, all of these things. Every year, we, when we get government, will at least set aside not less than 60 million to finance the Namibia Premier League, Rugby League, Tennis League, uh, Triathlon, uh, cycling, all of those leagues where even hockey, we are not that bad in hockey, netball, so that these things become a means of, of, of livelihood for our young people, not just to go and work at Pupkovits or work in our mine, but actually thrive as a sports person mm. and get a valuable income. And then you can load up other private sector companies to say, as government, we have shown our commitment, we trust our youth, we believe in them, we have put 60 or 70 million, we are still going to enhance it, but mining sector, uh, whatever sector of society that can finance, come in, put up every dollar that we put up, you put up another dollar, suddenly you have 120 million. Imagine how this country's sports yeah. will balloon without any limitation. These are the types of exciting things we have for the real estate called the Republic of Namibia. We have the ideas, we have the passion and the compassion, the commitment, the mind, the body, and the spirit to move society forward. Vote right and get ahead. Honorable, before I let you go, there's two more issues that I would like to lay before really, you. Really, Sylvie? Yes. I, I've outdone myself. <laughs> Goodness, girl. It's just to, it's the issue of uh, abortion. abortion and the LGBTQ community. And then last but not least, the veterinary court event. Should it go? Should it stay? Quickly, your views. <laughs> abortion, that is the act. We, we still believe that this is the way to go. This is section three. The circumstances under which abortion should be allowed. Health of the what mother. We currently have. Yeah, currently health of the mother health of the, of the fetus, mental health issues of the mother, in instances where the child is likely to, to come out deformed and so on, uh, then, then you can allow for, for this abortion. But also the way that they, they, they've done it is to say, it's not just one medical practitioner, but at least two that must, that must actually, actually. So what we have now, I think, uh, can work. Uh, and I know there are others that may not like it. I, I understand their concerns. Abortion is a difficult issue. Mm. It's a very emotional issue, even for fathers, uh, young women, young mothers. It's not an easy thing. So, so we are very, I'm saying this with, with every sensitivity, unless somebody can give us a reason why what we have currently is, is not working. And I know we've been told that many, I think there was a motion also tabled by uh, the president of NUDO, that many young girls actually go to South Africa for abortion or do it illegally and so on, uh, because this is prohibitive. But I think we must generally have a, a, a discussion around it so that we don't lose the discourse of uh, the circumstances around which we must allow abortion. Because I find that in the United States, the, the question of reproductive health of the mother and the rights that quite clearly accrue to her on the basis of her gender is, is a fundamental issue that's correct, that women must be given a choice to, to, to take decisions about her, her reproductive health and so on. However, I find that that society has normalized killing, that abortion is just about the judgment of the woman and that the killing of fetuses has become an industry that makes billions in its own right. That, I think, is not where we want to take society. And that uh, part of our convictions come uh, not just from the legal uh, arena, but from uh, our cultural practices and our religious orientation. You know, 
when a child is born, that child, and it took a, a Western woman to write about it, that child belongs to the village, to the community. Therefore, it takes a village to raise a child. And so in Africa, we have a different cultural orientation where this child belongs to us. If you don't want this child, you can give it to auntie, you can give it to uncle, sisters, daughters, mother's child, uh, and so on. So, so I think normally our approach is, if, if this is outdated in the view of others, let's have a discussion about it. Let's have a well thought out, uh, genuine and honest discussion about it. If it is women that feel they are discriminated or their rights are not recognized, Let's have a discussion about it so that we can adjust when necessary with good reason and with scientific evidence our position uh, and say maybe we can move an inch toward liberalizing the, the, the abortion regime. Uh, but with good scientific reason uh, without forgetting the cultural and, and, and the religious orientations and so on. But as it is now, in the absence of um, evidence uh, that, that, that requires perhaps us to, to, to deal with the issue in a manner that uh, would be different. We, we can't just, just move our, our perspective, but we've got to be sensitive uh, about this matter. And, and I think it's something that we will take up about the question of young women that are committing unlawful abortions. And then there are consequences for the womb that they are unable to ever get kids. Yeah, there are consequences for the emotional well-being uh, because clearly after she has committed an unlawful abortion, this woman cannot seek counseling because then there would be a criminalization of what she has done. And so many women probably suffer in silence, in particular young girls suffer in silence. We've got to be sensitive about it and do a bit more homework around, around this question. So, so you see my position is flexible and as a party we are a bit flexible that we understand yeah. that this is where we stand, but there could be instances that would require us to to, to say, let's discuss the matter and be flexible in this. The red line, I think the ministry spokesperson the other day was saying that there are areas um, that have not had uh, food and mouth for 10 years and they would move the red, uh, the red line uh, some kilometers northwards. I think that's fine. I think that's a responsible way in which it should be done uh, and, and that uh, those farmers should be inducted into a program of scheduled vaccinations of their animals like the rest of us do so that uh, we don't get diseases uh, coming out as a result of farmers not willing to pay for the, medic medi uh, for the vaccines, for the medication, um, and that uh, the quality of the animals must then also be looked at. So it is something to do with economic equity. Mm. Uh, that, 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 and it will be therefore right that eventually the red line is removed. But it is also a sadic white issue. Uh, remember, the other countries do not necessarily have this issue where they are exporting to the European Union in the way that we do. So ours is a very advanced system, both in terms of animal and meat tracing systems. We are far advanced in South Africa. Why are we exporting to the European Union and to the rest of the world? And why are our veterinary conditions so strict? Because we are a small population, a small market, but we have good quality cattle. So for farmers to survive and to thrive, they have to export. And because we have to export as a country, we have had over the past 50 to 70 years, we have had to put up major requirements that are in tandem with what the EU wants. And so in that respect, we are very advanced. Uh, but if the situation could have been different if we had 60, 70 million people and our consumption would be, would be sourced, all of it from here. So the small population size that we have forces us to have the instances of something called the red line. Mm -hmm. If we were able to consume all our meat, if we did not have to export it because we have a big population, we would probably, would probably not have this problem. South Africa consumes a lot of its beef, buys still uh, beef and mutton and goats. And so the, their system is not as, as strict as, as, yeah. as ours. So there is a good positive as well as a, a negative to uh, a small population one of which is that we have to bind ourselves to stringent veterinary, global veterinary um, uh, regulations. And by the way, the EU veterinary regulations are the strictest in the world. That's why Namibian beef can enter any other part of the world. Because if you have succeeded to convince the European Union that your beef is safe, that the health conditions of your animals are top of the range, 
you find that no other market will ever really reject your beef on the basis of animal health considerations uh, or quality considerations or rangeland quality considerations because we are just that good and we are blessed with a good piece of land. So um, uh, the red line, eventually it will go, but if you can progressively move it backward, I think responsibly and so on, I think there must also be internal fencing from Zambesi, some fencing in between the Gavango East and Gavango West, some fencing in between uh, Ohangwena uh, and uh, Oshikoto, some fencing so that if you have a foot and mouth outbreak in Zambesi, it doesn't need to go all the way to, to the western side to Kunene uh, because the animals can are moving freely. But if you can block it in Zambesi, you would have blocked the animal health problem in Zambesi uh, but our people do not have the political will. Only LPM has the political will to take those progressive decisions yes. for the sake of the people of the Republic of Namibia, to lead them into a stronger, better economic and social livelihood in the second and third half of the 21st century. What do you think about that interview? Comment down below and let us know who you will be voting for. Don't forget to follow along as we unpack all the social issues, environmental issues, and all the issues that is important to you. Now, Namibia, let's go vote 27 November 2024.